Good morning. Am I on? I'm coming through. Good morning. Welcome to worship this morning. It's a bit quieter this morning. It's the September weekend. We've managed to get through the first bit of term and now we're getting a wee breather um, with the September break. So um, if you're away and you're joining us online, then we um, are really delighted that you're doing so. But a warm welcome to all those who have gathered here this morning and to those gathering online. Um, I've got some notices to highlight. Um, you may recall that over the winter weeks, we enjoy on a Monday sharing soup together. The Pit Cairn is open every morning for teas and coffees, and then on a Thursday, it's got a huge buzz for the burgers. And on Mondays, it's also in the winter time, a really special time where we serve soup. And it really means a lot to those who attend. Um, but as always, we love Arota, churches love Arota, um, and we would love some more names. Um, so uh, Moira's made up a Super Monday Rota, and we've got folk who make the soup. Um, we were struggling for volunteers to make the soup, but I've just noticed that Moira has scored out the request for soup makers because I've got two more volunteers for making soup. But there's always room. Um, I made it once. Never to repeat it. I was like, a soup, you just stick it all in a pot. What can go wrong? <laughs> you would not believe what could go wrong when I'm let loose in the kitchen. So um, for everyone's benefit, I am not on the soup rota. Um, but if you would like to, um, then please get on board. Um, also, there's a notice for me to highlight, which is the pop-up choir. Um, as you know, every so often, um, we get the choir together for an event. Um, we especially love it when the choir sings over Christmas time. So, the pop-up choir are intending to get together soon to learn our Christmas music. Look out for the notices and more information. Okie dokie. Um, I have had no tweets. I have had no messages. But does any, has anybody had a birthday or a celebration or anything, anything? Bob is getting his own back on Betty. Oh, uh, a birthday? Friday, come on out. There's no hiding. There may be crosswords in the pew later on today. So was it last Friday, just passed? And did you have a nice day? A super day. Excellent. Well, there, that's it there. There we are, brilliant. Ah, you've got it done, done perfectly. Well done, Betty, thank you. Anything that could have gone wrong did go wrong in the manse this morning. And as I gathered my thoughts in the vestry, Psalm 136 came to mind. Give thanks. Give thanks to the Lord for he is good. His love endures forever. Give thanks to the God of God. His love endures forever. Give thanks to the Lord of Lords, his love endures forever. And all of life's busyness and all of life's quietness, God's love endures. Let's now join our voices together as we sing our opening hymn, How Lovely on the Mountains.
how great and comforting it is to know that the Lord reigns, that that love endures forever, can reign in our hearts. Let's now join together in prayer as we um, pray, and then the Lord's Prayer will be on the screen that we'll say together if you need it. Let's pray. Father, thank you that you are a good God, that you are a loving God. Thank you that you are the God who reigns above everything, above every worldly power, above every um, dominion. Thank you that you are all powerful. Thank you that you are all loving. Thank you that as we gather here as a family, you know each one of us. You know our names. You know our worries. You know our joys. And you love us. We bring ourselves to you this morning in worship. We bring you our hearts. We bring you our minds. And so too, we bring you our offerings. As we place them in the plate, as they digitally get sent, we pray that you would use them for your purposes. We dedicate them for your kingdom and for your glory. And so, as we bring you all that we have, We unite our voices in the prayer that Jesus taught his disciples when he said, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever. Amen. Now, I was worried that because the DJ club isn't on, I thought nobody's bothered to come this morning. I thought there was going to be no kids. And it's lovely to see you gathered for our family service today. Now, when I came in, there was an envelope sitting on the desk and I thought it said Reverend Louise Purden. Oh, it was very exciting. What what am I getting? <laughs> and it's the minutes and the agenda for the Kirk session meeting at the start of October. Oh, that was very underwhelming. Envelopes, it's so exciting when you get post and you think, what's in the envelope? And you know, you can tell straight away, oh, it's something dead boring. But then when you get an actual envelope, and so I have some actual envelopes with me this morning. And in these actual envelopes, there's an invitation. So who would like, Maisie, you were first in today. Would you like to choose an envelope? Oh, you're going for the red one. Do you want to read and see what it says? Open it up. Nice nails. Yeah. Now, I think, yep, that's it. It's just tucked in. This is a tricky envelope to open, I have to say. That's it, you've got it. What does it say? You are invited to a birthday party. You're invited to a birthday party. What do you think? Do you want to go? Yeah. Have you been invited to a birthday party before? Yeah. Are they quite good fun? Excellent. Right, let's see. Would any would anybody else? Joni, do you want to pick an envelope? Here we go, three to choose from. Oh, nice. That's a fancy envelope. Let's see what's inside. Oh, is that an invitation? You're invited to a church picnic by the beach. Extra points for being able to read my writing. That's very impressive. Um, would you like to go? Excellent. Brooke, while I'm here, do you want to choose one? You've got nice nails too. Has everybody been getting manicures? Right, what's in this envelope? Let's have a look. You're invited to your annual Greenbush Church picnic. You're invited (laughs) 
to your annual dentist checkup. What do you think? Are you excited about that? Neutral. <laughs> Neutral. I like it. You're not, I, I would be more disappointed. But do you know what? You're absolutely right. Um, oh, you can keep that. Uh, it's important that you go to your annual checkup because then you don't get any surprises later down the line. Uh, do you want to have a look at the last one? Hello, you. Let's see what's in this one. Big sister's going to help you read it out. You're invited to a school's parents' night. Wow, how do you feel about that? Oh, she's not a parent. Not invited. You're, well, you get to go with your parents. What do you think? Are you excited? No, no, that's not. Would you rather go to a party? Yeah, absolutely. So, yes, you got the party. You got the birthday one. So, we have all these different invitations. Some of them are really exciting, like barbecues and birthdays. And some of them are maybe a bit less appealing, like the dentist or parents night you think oh gosh I'm invited to that but I'm not sure about it and we're thinking today in our story about an invitation where a man invites Paul to come over to where he is and I was thinking about that word invitation and how powerful it is to be invited and thinking about how Jesus invites us to be part of his story he invites us to a life of adventure following him but also, we get an opportunity to invite other people to say to our friends, come, come join us. Be part of what we're doing. The invitation is for everybody. Everybody is invited. And it's a great adventure that we're invited to go on. Let's now sing our next song together, which is Jesus Put This Song Into Our Hearts. When I chose that hymn, I remembered you played it brilliantly, Ian. <laughs> Thank you. Now, I think Moira said there was no one on reading. There's no one on reading? <sighs> Which is a pity because it's got loads of big words in it. <laughs> so this is where I have to, the challenge, where I uh, have to read some of the challenging name places. But as I always say to folk, just say it confidently. Nobody will correct you on it. So don't correct me. So we're reading, we're continuing in our story from Acts. And the DJ Club have been looking at Acts, and so we've been in line with them. Whatever topics are being pulled out from this amazing story, um, we are thinking through over the weeks together. But I do encourage you to read Acts as a book. We are just picking little chunks out, but their whole book is absolutely brilliant as we hear of these stories of this new church that's being born. 
I don't know about you, but I've really enjoyed looking at the very roots, at the very start of how the church movement began and thinking about how we are part and we are continuing that movement today. When I sent in the passage for today, I said we were going to start from verse 10. And verse 10 says, after Paul had seen the vision, we got ready. But actually, I should have really started at verse 9, which tells you what the vision was. What is this vision that Paul, that, um, Paul, that got Paul moving? So let me just read for you verse 9. During the night, Paul had a vision of a man of Macedonia standing and begging him, come over to Macedonia and help us. After Paul had seen the vision, we got ready at once to leave for Macedonia, concluding that God had called us to preach the gospel to them. From Taurus, we put out to sea and sailed straight for Samothrace. And the next day, we went to Neapolis. From there, we traveled to Philippi, a Roman colony, and the leading city of the district of Macedonia. We stayed there several days. On the Sabbath, we went outside the city gate to the river where we expected to find a place of prayer. We sat down and began to speak to the women who had gathered there. One of those listening was a woman from the city of Thyatira named Lydia a dealer in purple cloth. She was a worshipper of God. The Lord opened her heart to respond to Paul's message. When she and the members of her household were baptized, she invited us to her home. If you consider me a believer in the Lord, she said, come and stay at my house. And she persuaded us. Amen. Let's now join our voices once more as we sing our next song, Go Tell It on the Mountain.
as I explained, I'd had quite a morning. Um, most Sundays, I'll be honest, I'll let you in a secret. Most Sundays, I have a fight with my printer. Everybody knows printers are out to get us. And every week, I have a bit of a battle with it. And this week, the printer won. So um, I have a feeling I'm going to go back home and look in the study, and there's going to be 300 copies of today's sermon. Um, however, we are having to uh, go digitally as I um, emailed it to myself. So apologies, apologies. I'm much more of a paper girl, but we're going technical today. So our dip into Acts continues. You saw me trip over some of the names of the places in the passage today. And geography isn't my thing, but some of you may find that really interesting. I remember um, when I was training, one of the first uh, training seminars on sermons was about saying, make sure you don't just stick to your own style of things that you like. If you just like telling stories, then put in some facts for people to bite on. Everyone is so different, and that's always a challenge in worship, is everybody has an appeals to different things. So for those that are into geography, let me tell you a little of some of the places that I struggled to read out to you. So we're in Taurus revisiting all the places. Those that have been worshipping with us in the last few weeks will know Barnabas and Paul were set to go on uh, revisiting all the places where they'd seen God doing amazing things and signs and wonders and folk coming to know Jesus. They were going to revisit those places. But then they had a big fallout and it ended up that Paul and Silas then went back revisiting, reconnecting with folk that uh, they'd um, been working alongside. And so Paul then gets this invitation to Macedonia, this vision that came to him in the night, so clear of the man begging. Macedonia was located in modern day southern Greece. So those that know Greece will realize that Macedonia is located down there. And Thrace is modern day Bulgaria and the European portion of modern-day Turkey. So all these places I was tripping over, they're Turkey, they're Greece, but they're familiar to places that we know. Present-day Republic of Macedonia includes a short portion of ancient Macedonia. It was part of Yugoslavia for many years, but then achieved independence in 1991. It is interesting, if you want to Google Maps this, you'll be able to see, and you can look on the map to see Paul's journey, see where was it he set sail from? Oh, then he got the boat over there. So interesting. I mention all this because it's a reminder that these stories are rooted in history. We are able to map Paul's trips out. We can see these documents are historically accurate. And if we can trust the accuracy of the geography, then we can trust the accuracy of the stories that are included. The amazing miracles and encounters can be trusted too. We had our first week at Alpha on Thursday, and we were talking about the historical evidence that points towards Jesus. We were talking about how there are so many um, well-documented Uh, facts of history that we completely trust, but actually the Bible and the gospel is so accurate. There's so much evidence to show that Jesus was in fact alive, and there's evidence to show that he was resurrected as well. We spoke about how we don't need historical accuracy to trust. Our faith isn't based on historical documents Our faith is on a relationship with Jesus. But doesn't it feel good that it's rooted in historical accuracy? And so too for these stories from Acts. We can have confidence that these aren't just stories penned by Luke. These are based on facts. And here we see Christianity coming to Europe. 
verse 9 is worth repeating again. A vision of a man begging for help. This isn't a, uh, Paul, if you've got time, would you mind doing a wee detour over to Macedonia, please? This isn't a, oh, you'll really like it in Macedonia. There's loads of interesting things. Please come over and visit us. He is begging. He is desperate to hear the good news. He is longing for it. We have a message of good news. And it's a message that others are longing to hear. We live in a world where there is so much negativity around. Sometimes we can feel completely overwhelmed by negativity. And yet, we have this message of hope, this message of good news. What comfort we find each day knowing that there is a heavenly Father who tends and cares for us. I can't imagine living life without that confidence. And I think the thing that's worth remembering is that Paul was on a mission to spread good news. This was Paul's whole vision. The vision was Paul's vision, his mission to bring that good news. I was out yesterday with some friends for lunch, friends I'd known in my 20s, and here we were all sat round a table in our 40s, lamenting the pressures of life, sharing with each other the struggles of juggling parenting and work and all the demands of life, not the carefree 20-year-olds that we were when we used to hang out together. It was real honest sharing. It was real, authentic life. And I came back to Richard. And I said, gosh, I'm so glad I've got faith. I'm so glad I've got something that grounds me, that gives me that hope. We have a message of good news. We can know purpose. People need to hear that message. There are people in Bonnyrigg who are crying out, come and help. Can you hear me? I'm begging. Our message of good news is not one that's contained to a Sunday morning in these four walls. It's a message that draws us out. I wonder if the church has forgotten the power of the gospel that we're called to proclaim. The reason that we're trying to get out in the community to connect with people isn't to stop our church dying, isn't to keep numbers up, to keep the thing going. It's about the message of hope. It's about a message of good news. It's about creating a harbor where people can come and dock, a place of hope and restoration, a harbor where they can know they are loved where they can know that they matter and that they're not alone. This is our message. This is what the people in Bonnyrigg are begging of us. And then Paul goes on the Sabbath out to, say, to find the people of prayer. His, um, his approach was to go to the synagogues first, to find the people where there was already faith and then be able to direct them to Jesus. It's what he did everywhere he went. Where's the people of faith? Right, let me point them to Jesus. But in this area, there was no synagogue. So he had to track them down. And as the psalm talks about going by the rivers of Babylon, so he went to find the rivers where people would be gathering. And here he meets Lydia. Lydia is a beautiful example of someone with an open heart who is ready to receive the gospel. The detail of mentioning she was a dealer in purple cloth shows that she would be hanging out with the elite. It was only the best and fancy folk that were allowed to wear purple. You couldn't just wear purple if you were anybody. And I like how she persuaded Paul, please stay with us. 
But actually, with the size of her household, she was probably living in some really nice accommodation. I'm not sure Paul would have taken too much persuasion to say, oh, yeah, oh, oh, to tomorrow, sure, I'll stay. It's likely that Lydia's house would have been absolutely lovely. Let me share a little bit about what I was reading about Lydia. She is the only Philippian, Phil, Philippian convert who is named in Acts. So we see the letter of Philippians that we have in the Bible. That's the church that Paul is writing to. And we know that after Paul and his group spent several weeks staying with her, this is where the church was born. We know that the Lord opened her heart, giving her spiritual gifts and abilities to help her in this new radical community. She is most likely to have led and cared for the first congregation there. She's an example of how the gospel freed people of gender, regardless of their previous religious background or economic status. Paul often gets a hard press for being anti-women. There's some verses and some lines that he says that women find pretty tricky. And yet here we see him elevating this woman into a position of leadership. Women like Lydia were at the center of the early church. They had a variety of roles, including caring for local groups, evangelizing, furthering the Christian mission. The church at Philippi existed because of Lydia's generous heart, welcoming home. Her faith, intelligence, practical skills and initiative, her courage and pastoral care continue to make her the ideal role model for women in the church today. So often we hear of the stories of all the different men and all that they did, men of faith. Here's a hero of faith, a woman who established the first church in Europe. And isn't it interesting that the vision, which was for a man, there was a man that was begging them, and yet it was women who Paul encountered and who started the first church. The vision of that man calling for help is one that we as the church need to take seriously. That vision led Paul to Lydia, where she opened up her home, hosting the first church. That church that she started is the same church that we are part of, that we are trying to build. As we lean on one another, let us lean on the Spirit and trust the Spirit leading us. Let's pray. Father, thanks for all the stories and acts. So inspiring to hear of those people of faith making a difference. Father, as Paul had that vision, we know that there are many also begging for help, desperate for good news. Let us be carriers of that wherever we go. In Jesus' name, amen. Let us join our voices once more as we sing, you laid aside your majesty.
As always, we remember others in our prayers. We remember Jenny, who is walking for Play Midlothian. We're missing all the family this morning, but we'll be praying for strength for them. Let's now join our hearts in prayer. Let us pray. Father, we are reminded of the message of good news in a world where there is so much need, in a world where there is so much suffering. We thank you for good news. When Monday can hit hard, we thank you that we have good news when fears of getting through the month financially overwhelm. Thank you that we have good news. When health deteriorates, we thank you for good news. Good news that you are a creator. Good news that you love us. Good news that you are the Prince of Peace. That even in the worst of conflicts, there is that hope of peace that can be found in you. And so we continue to pray for our world and we continue to pray for a miracle of peace. We continue to bring before you the Ukraine. We continue to bring before you the Middle East. We continue to bring before you all areas of conflict and division, all areas of war, knowing that peace can be found in you. We, pay, we pray for the peace builders, those in on the ground, working with groups, building communities, We thank you that we can see that there is a different way to live. And we pray for those who are pointing to that different way. Father, as we continue to look at the beginnings of your church, we pray for your church throughout the world. We continue to pray for those who are persecuted, for those who meet in secret. We pray they would know your blessing. We pray they would know they are not forgotten. And we continue to pray for your church here in Scotland. For the Church of Scotland, that you would lead us, direct us, inspire us. And for your church here in Bonnyrigg. For Our Lady, for Cockpen and Carrington. Last Weedon was well. For the Episcopal Church and all that they're doing, we pray your blessing. We thank you that we are one church, one in heart and one in vision. Father, we pray for Jenny and our friends as they walk today, raising money for Play Midlothian. Father, something as simple as play is so powerful. We lament that we are in a world where we need funding to get alongside children in need, to encourage them to play, to nourish them through play. We pray that you'd give Jenny and Danielle and the others all the energy that they need And we pray for Play Midlothian to flourish as it supports those in need in Midlothian. We pray for our schools. We pray for our nurseries. We pray for the pupils of this community. In this September weekend, 
may they feel rested and restored. And we pray for the chaplaincy work that takes place in the schools. We pray that we would be bringing that message of good news into the classrooms and assembly halls. We continue to pray for Josh and for the work he's involved with. We thank you for the drop-in cafe. We thank you for Toasty Tuesday. We thank you for the various projects that he's part of. Continue to lead him and to guide him. And Father, for each one of us, we each carry our own personal needs, our own worries, our own concerns over loved ones. We bring them to you in the quiet. Thank you that you are not a distant God, that you are a God who hears our cries and you are a God whose love endures forever. We bring all of these prayers in the powerful name of Jesus. Amen. Let's once more join our voices together as we sing our final hymn, What a Friend We Have in Jesus. May we each know the refuge, the harbour, the safe knowledge of knowing Jesus is with us. And may we carry that message of good news. Let's say the grace together. May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all now and forever. Amen.